want you in, uh, to invite you to stand with me as we read our scripture this morning. The scripture is going to be taken from Second uh, Kings. Second Kings. I'm going to stand in honor of the Word of God. I know. It's on the screen, but if you have your Bibles or your devices, you can turn there. I'm going to read to you in your hearing from the New King James Version of the Bible, 2 Kings chapter 6, starting at verse 24. 2 Kings chapter 6, starting at verse 24. And it happened after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and indeed they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and one-fourth of a cab of doves' droppings for a shekel of silver. Then, as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him, saying, Help me, O Lord King, uh, help me, my Lord, O King. And he said, If the Lord does not help you, where can I find help for you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? Then the king said to her, What is your trouble? And she answered, This woman said to me, Give me your son, that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And I said to her on the next day, Give me your son, that we may eat him. But she has hidden her son. Now it happened when the king heard the words of the woman that he tore his clothes. And as they passed by on the wall, the people looked. Under, and there underneath, he had sackcloth on his body. Today, I'd like to share a message with you using the title, What Makes a Mother Good? What makes a mother good? Father, in the name of Jesus, uh, we have been in, a, in an outstanding worship experience thus far. And we pray, Lord, that our, our, our wonderful worship experience would continue through the preaching of the word. And so we ask uh, for an extra portion of the Holy Spirit to bless us. Speak, Lord, for your children are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. What makes a mother good? The dictionary simply defines the word mother as a woman who gives birth to a child, or a woman who adopts a child, or a woman who raises a child. Sim sim simply define a woman who gives birth to a child, a woman who adopts a child, or a woman who raises a child, a mother. On July 1st, 1988, my wife gave birth to her oldest child, a girl. Now she, at that moment, became a mother. Six years later, she gave birth to her second child, another girl. Two years later, a boy. Her third, a few years later, a fourth, another girl. And yes, three years later, her fifth, a boy. It only takes one child to be a mother, but five really makes her a mother. And over the years, I have had the pleasure of watching Charlotte Brand raise our kids. Hallelujah. Babe, it's been enjoyable. And thank you very much uh, for being a great mother. Hallelujah. Oh, y'all can clap. Now, it was my intention in this message to use a single word to describe, listen to me, the qualities of a mother. One word to describe the qualities of a mother. So I spent some time going through the dictionary to find a term that singularly identifies a woman as a good mother or a bad mother, exceptional mother or a, a subpar mother, a single word. I thought perhaps that the singular word mom would be that word. 
I heard some folks say that anyone can be a mother, but not everyone can be a mom, intending to differentiate between birthing a child and raising a child well. But the word mom, by definition, is simply informal jargon for mother. The term does not, the term does not speak to quality, only origin. I thought perhaps that the single word parent could describe the outstanding qualities of a, a mother. I've heard people say, and I've even said it myself, folk need to parent their children. Am I the only one? Implying quality in child rearing. But the word parent, like the word mom and the word mother by definition, does not imply quality, only origin. Even the words rear or rearing or reared, though they speak to raising a child, they too by themselves do not speak to quality in the task. The terms mother and mom do not of themselves describe how well a child is reared. Each word needs to be preceded by an adjective that, uh, to define the quality of the job the mother is performing. In other words, we say she's a good mother or a great mother or a loving mother or a caring mother. Therefore, we can conclude that giving birth to a child or adopting a child or raising a child does not automatically make a woman a good mother or a great mother or a loving mother or a caring mother. Giving birth or adopting or raising a child only makes a woman a mother. What then makes a woman a good or great or loving or caring mother? What, what, what do they do to qualify? Who are they inside to qualify? Is there a single quality that all superior mothers possess that qualifies them to be identified as good or great or loving or caring? Today, I want to look at an incident in Scripture involving two mothers. The narrative is a subsection of a larger narrative. The incident, we read it in our Scripture reading, was shared to emphasize or highlight, watch this, the complete despair of a king. But in my estimation, it gives us a glimpse into what makes a mother good or great or loving or caring. Then I want to take what we learn from that story and put it up against a passage of, another passage of Scripture so we can understand the depth of God's love for His children. We're going we're gonna to look at one text and learn something, and then we're going to place it against another text and learn something else. Amen? It is absolutely, we're going we're gonna to understand the depth of God's love for His children, and it's absolutely necessary for all of us to clearly and completely understand the depth of God's love for us if we are to say, stay sane in this insane world and thrive in this world and make it out of this world. We got to understand how deep God's love is for us. We got to, we got, and understanding how much mothers love their children, understanding how much mothers love their children will help us to understand how much more God loves us. In the Old Testament uh, book, Second Kings, there's a strange account that helps us identify that single quality that makes all good or great or caring or loving mothers such. Second Kings, chapter 6. In it, the ten tribes of the Hebrew people known as Israel are in conflict with the nation of Syria. This is the time of the prophet Elisha. Every time the Syrian king plans a military initiative against Israel, God tells Elisha, and Elisha tells the king of Israel, and the king of Israel foils the king of Syria's plans. In response, the king 
Uh, the Syrian king tries to capture Elijah, but this too fails. So the Syrian king, he besieges Samaria, which is the capital for the nation of Israel. To besiege, to besiege means to surround the city with an army so that, so that no one in the city can come out and no supplies can come in. The idea is to cause a famine. Uh, the idea is to starve the people into surrender. The text says in chapter 6 of 2 Kings, verse 26, that during this, this siege and during this famine, a woman came to the king as he was walking on the walls of the city, and a woman asked in desperation for help. The king asked the woman, what's troubling her? And the woman tells the king of how her and another woman plan to avoid starvation, at least for a little while longer. She said, she says, 2 Kings chapter 6, starting in verse 20, she says this, this woman said to me, give your son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. <laughs> so we boiled my son and ate him. We should share this type of stuff with people who say they don't read the Bible because the Bible is boring. <laughs> and you, you don't even get this one on HBO. <laughs> so we boiled my son and ate him and said, and I said to her on the next day, give your son that we may eat him. But she has hidden her son. I can't wrap my mind around, okay, <laughs> I don't know why she didn't smack the woman and say, get out of my face with your crazy suggestion to start. Then I can't make sense, come on, y'all know, come on. Then I can't make sense of the fact that she went through with it. and actually expected the lady to go through with it on her side. And I only imagine that she's come to the king with, 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 with a few emotions in her body. Number one, horrified that she did such a thing, saddened that she did such a thing, and angry that she was betrayed. The question we're attempting to answer is, what makes a woman a good or great or loving or caring mother? And, and I believe that from this horrific, troubling story of cannibalism, we can find an answer. In the text, the situation in Samaria is desperate. The people are starving. There's nothing to eat. And it's so bad that two ladies agree to eat their children. It's unimaginable that the woman, the woman actually killed her child, then cooked her child and ate her child, and then shared some of her child with somebody else to eat. The other mother is no better. It's unthinkable that she would suggest to another mother that they eat their children. These ladies were not simply hungry. They were in severe starvation. Despite that, no one here would describe either of these women, but especially the mother of the eaten child, to be a good mother or a great mother or a caring mother. A better description would probably, probably be crazy, but for the sake of the message, selfish. Yet, from the failure of these two mothers, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me, we can learn what makes a good or great or loving or caring mother. From their failure, we can learn what makes a good or great or loving or caring mother. 
And here's the point. Here's my point. A good mother or a great mother or a loving mother or a caring mother, hear me and hear me well, is not selfish. That's it. That's how profound it is right there. Nothing else. I know you wanted something mad. Nothing. A good mother, a loving mother, a caring mother is not selfish. Ever. She's selfless, self-sacrificing, and here's a word for you, and prodigal. Not in the sense of wasteful, but in the sense of bountiful or generous. Good mother, self-sacrificing, selfless, prodigal. I believe it to be a fair assessment that a good mother or a great mother, a loving mother, a caring mother would never consider ingesting her own child. It's a fair assessment. What do you say? I know that circumstances were severe in that situation. I know that, I know that the circumstances they were in were dire. I know that I don't know what it's like to be hungry to the point of desperation. But I don't know what it's like to be loved by a, but I, excuse me, but I do know what it's like to be loved by a mother who would work overtime so she could earn enough money to buy her son's football cleats. I do know what it's like to watch a mother eat less or nothing so her kids can eat. I do know what it's like to watch my wife stay up all night because her baby is sick and then the next day homeschool the rest of the kids, kids without even taking a nap. I know uh, that mothers stand toe-to-toe with abusive dads, declaring that they will not abuse her children. I know that mothers work multiple jobs so that their children can stay in church school or have money for college or go on that trip. I know that mothers, um, good mothers and and great mothers and caring mothers and loving mothers, I know uh, women like this who are selfless and would rather die than see anything bad happen to their children. I know this is true. I was, I think I was watching TV this week. Or if I wasn't watching TV, I heard it on podcasts. I can't remember, but I told Charlotte about it. I think it was on the news. The guy was recounting um, a trip he took to one of the forests that burned up in the United States. I don't know which one of the national parks it was in. And said they came up to a tree, and at the bottom of a tree there was a bird who had been burned up. So he kicked the bird, and when he kicked the bird, there were three baby birds underneath still alive. A mother would rather lose her life than her children lose their life. These birds couldn't fly. She could have flew away. But mothers don't fly away. Mothers would rather die than their children be harmed. Now, I mean, I said it twice already. I'm going to say it again. I'm horrified. I I am absolutely horrified by the account of the two mothers in 2 Kings. I can't make sense of any mother thinking such a thing, let alone doing such a thing. And neither could the king of Israel. The The text says that when he heard the mother's story, he tore his clothes as a sign of distress and mourning. And in this account, The most natural, listen to me, the most natural affections of the mind, the most natural affections of the mind, in this story, the most natural affections of the mind, to love something you gave birth to, to protect and care for something you gave, the most natural affections of the mind, listen to me, were overpowered by the natural appetite of the body. Today, Mothers are not boiling their children and then eating them, but some of them, in their selfishness, are harming them. The most natural affections of their minds are overpowered by the natural appetites of their bodies. They smoke and drink and use drugs while they are pregnant. Uh, They're too lazy to cook for their children. Uh, They allow strange men around their children and ignore and abuse these men uh, and let the men inflict Uh, anything they want to on their children because they want the man more than they care about their children. 
the most natural affections, y'all, what I'm saying, of their minds, the inclination to love what you gave birth to is overpowered by, by the natural appetites of their bodies. How many of us allow what we know to be right to be overpowered by what we feel? What makes a mother a good or great or loving or caring mother is not selfishness, watch this, but selflessness, self-sacrifice. Not, not, not selfishness, not the selfishness we see, see in 2 Kings. The good mother puts the needs of her children before her needs. I believe that today we need more good mothers and great mothers. Y'all can say amen loud and that, and caring mothers and loving mothers. Mothers who will be selfless no matter the circumstances. Mothers who will put the good of their children ahead of their own. Mothers who, who will protect their children at all times and at all costs, no matter the circumstances, good or bad, better or worse. And if someone comes to these good mothers, these great mothers and loving and caring mothers, if someone comes to them um, and suggests to them that it's to their own personal benefit to harm their child, I want those good mothers and great mothers and caring mothers and loving mothers to say to them proverbially that they should boil and eat their own kids. Are y'all listening to what I'm saying? Huh? Harm your child. It's going to be beneficial if you hurt your child. No, you go boil your own children. Are you serious? <laughs> Mamas out there, what if some, somebody came to you and told you to do that? Can we get a mic let them come up and start testifying? <laughs> we may have to baptize a few people with the things they'll say. <laughs> Am I right? Sister Secretary. As difficult as it is for us to understand how any mother could harm her child, let alone eat her child, there, is, there, there are situations in this sinful world, uh, like severe starvation, please hear me, that break the very strong cords of affection that a mother has toward her children and cause or allow a mother to act selfishly uh, to the harm of that child. I don't understand it. I, I have a hard time wrapping my, my mind around it. But in the sinful world, there are situations that come about that, that break those strong cords of affection. And, and, and they do things that we can't imagine. It's, it's, it, it is what it is. But I'm so glad that the same thing is not true about the God we serve. <laughs> y'all missed that. Are y'all with me? In the 49th chapter of Isaiah, the prophet, uh, uh, Isaiah, he's in prophetic vision, and God has promised deliverance in vision from captivity to the nation of Judah. But according to uh, verse 14 of Isaiah chapter 49, the, the people believe that God has abandoned them. Isaiah, 14, Isaiah 49 verse 14, it says this, But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me, and my Lord has forgotten me. In response, God asks a question. Verse 15, he says, watch this. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? And then God, in response to his own question, though not connected to 2 Kings, confirms what we learn from 2 Kings and serves to emphasize God's great love for his children by contrasting it with a mother's love for her children. So God says, I have to demonstrate how much I love them, and the only way I can do it is put my love up against a mother's love. There's no other love that I can do. Mother's love versus God's love. So it, can a woman forget her nursing child? Right? Right? Can, can a mother, can, 
implied in, 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 in forgetting is a disconnection. It's my understanding, and y'all ladies correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I don't think so because I've been through five and I got a grandson too, so I think I'm good. <laughs> it's my understanding that a woman nurses a, when a woman nurses a child, her body naturally begins a lactation cycle. This cycle informs the mother when feeding, when, when it's feeding time. If the mama misses the feeding time, the mother's breasts start to leak, and if they take too long, they start to hurt. Stay with me. So it's reasonable to assume that when a mother is nursing her child, it's very hard to forget her child. Breast hurt, breast leak, hard to forget. Yet God says in Isaiah 49, surely they may forget. The mothers in 2 Kings forgot. But God says, yet I will not forget you. Oh, y'all. He says, behold, I have inscribed you in the palms of my hands. God says a mother, even a good mother or a great mother or a caring mother or a loving mother whose body naturally reminds them to feed their children might forget their children. But he who created woman and put uh, the lactation cycle in her, the one who created the sun and the moon and the stars and the birds and the bugs and the beasts and the trees and the herbs, the one who sustains all things and upholds all things and holds all things together by the words of his mouth, the one who feeds the sparrow and clothes the lilies of the field, the one who has promised to supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. This God promises never to forget you. He said, I've inscribed you in the palms of my hands. What I'm trying to say is simply this, that the love of a mother, you come on, man, has, the love a mother has for her child, listen to me, is extremely strong. Watch this. It's, it's, it, listen to me. The love... Only the most extreme circumstances, like, like severe starvation, can cause a mother to harm her child. And to demonstrate how great his love for his, for, is for his children, God has chosen to contrast his love with that of a mother, suggesting that his is even stronger. Y'all missed that. It takes severe starvation for, or some, some other severe, out of this unthinkable stuff for a mother to harm. When we hear about mothers doing stuff to their child, their children, they, they, they have severe mental struggles. Something has happened that is completely abnormal. Mothers don't do that. God says, mothers don't forget their children. Not normally, but surely because they're human, because they're in the flesh, they may forget. But my love is so strong that I cannot forget. So to every mother here, and what, so what I'm saying is your love, mothers, understand how God sees your love. Understand how God, 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 to every mother here and every mother watching and every child here and every child watching, please understand the depth of the love between a mother and a child. It's only surpassed by God's love for us. Know that love. Experience that love. Cherish that love and celebrate that love because only the love of, that God has for his children surpasses that of a mother for her children.
Y'all didn't say amen. My wife loves them kids more than she loves me. And I'm okay with that. Hallelujah. If they had to eat or I had to eat, guess who's not eating? So, today, mothers, whether by birth, by adoption, by rearing, or by invitation, because some of you have been invited to be mothers, we salute you. We appreciate you. We thank you. And we love you. I wonder if any man wants to stand up and give the mothers in this place a standing ovation. Any man. I wonder if any children want to stand up and turn to their mamas and give them a standing ovation. Turn to your mama and clap for a man. Amen. Hallelujah. Give your mama a standing ovation, Mariah. Come on. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you something, man. Everybody's got a mama. Everybody. Amen? And we ought to love them. Amen. My mama may watch this. Mama, I love you too. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. Come on, y'all sing for me before I start preaching some more. Let's have a prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you for um, just sharing with us through Scripture the depth of your love for us. We know and recognize, Lord, that mothers love their children, but you love us more. Your love is greater than their love. Hallelujah. May we never forget that. May that push us and draw us close to you, and may we settle in and be comfortable, just as comfortable in your love as we are in the love of our mothers. And when you come, may we see you in peace. Is our prayer in Jesus' name.